Gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome back to our last official session of the fifth day, the final day of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival for 2019. I just want to take a moment to do something that's actually very important for us, which is to thank our amazing sponsors at the festival. Um, we're really proud to have Z Entertainment as our title partner and Nexa, they came on board for the first time this year as our associate partner. We'd love to also thank our venue partners, Rajan Kilachand and the Bank of Baroda, the JCB Prize for Literature Bookstore, managed by Full Circle. I hope you've all had a chance to visit the bookstore and buy lots of books. Our cause partner, Detol Banega Swatch India, Black and White, who are our celebrations partner. Thank you to Jan Michalski, the Aga Khan Foundation, the Getty Foundation, J. Paul Getty Trust, British Council, Nordic Lights, Mahindra World City, Ertel, Kingfisher, Grover, CK Birla Hospitals, Avid Learning, and everyone else who's believed in the festival and continues their support. We're so, so grateful. Our new partners this year are Population Foundation of India, Child Labor Free Jaipur Initiative, DMI Finance, Dell, Sun Village, Air India, Ola, O2 Sparkle, and Spami. And big thank you to all of our publishers. None of us would be here without them. Penguin, MIT Press, Westland, Oxford Dictionaries, Murti Classical Library of India, Harvard University Press, and HarperCollins. So the future of, our, of every festival every year depends on its growing relationship, not just with our sponsors, but with our existing and our new audiences. Uh, so we'd really like to thank our media partners for helping us get the word out. Red FM and Rajasthan's very own Patrika Group and Baskar Group for their generous support year after year. And our new partners, Business Standard, Outlook and DNA. And finally, our social media partners, Facebook and Twitter, have of course, increased our reach around the world. And Vayus, Vi Wattpad and Launchora, our podcast partner. Now, you may have seen at the back of the program that they have actually announced the dates for next year's festival. So we really hope we'll see you all back here between the 23rd and the 27th of January, 2020. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our final, our final session. Um, at the end of this session, I'm also going to get up and thank some of the people um, here that have helped us run Samvad, and we'll have a little special presentation. Um, so just to let you know, we are now going to begin Triple Borders, a journey to the edge of Europe. Forgive me one second. Just drop my notes. So we have with us Kapka Kasabofa, who is in conversation with Max Rodenbeck, and this is presented today by the British Academy, who we're very grateful to have here. So Max Rodenbeck is, a South, is South Asia Bureau Chief for The Economist. He studied history in Egypt, and between 1989 and 2015, he roamed the Middle East as a reporter. Um, he authored a biography, Cairo, The City, Victorious, and he often writes not only for pub many publications, but for the New York Review of Books. So we're very honored to have him here today in conversation with Kapka Kasabova. Would you please join me in giving them a warm welcome to our final session here at Samvad. Hello, everyone. Uh, you all have an immense amount of stamina to last through the entire festival and still have the energy to come and see us. So we're really grateful. And it's lovely to have such an intimate audience. Um, and it's also with immense pleasure that I'm here to have a chat with, with Kapka, whose book I really loved, I have to say. I mean, I read a lot of books. I think it's my favorite book that I've read in the last year. Um, and it's, it's a book that's hard to describe, uh, but I absolutely encourage all of you to, to read it. Um, I should mention before starting that, uh, that Kapka is here courtesy of the British Academy uh, uh, as the recipient of their ma the fabulous uh, annual prize. It's, it's the fifth, this is the fifth year it's been given, I think? That's right. It's, and it's a prize for the nonfiction writing. Um, and it's, ap it's open to everyone. It's open to anyone. And nominations are opening soon. So if you know anyone anywhere in the world who's interested in winning a wonderful prize, 
uh, for doing a, uh, any work of nonfiction in virtually any field, uh, please pass on the word. It's the El Rodan Prize, Prize for Global Cultural Understanding, the British Academy. And it's thanks to them that Kapka is with us today. Um, it's hard to know where to begin. Um, I think I'd like to, st because it's such a wonderfully atmospheric book, um, and it's full of gorgeous little passages. Um, I'd just like to start with a tiny little thing, because there are a lot of tiny little things in this book that, that really sort of bring out atmosphere. It's a book that it's about, uh, it's, not, I don't, it's hard to say what it's about exactly, but there's, well, there's a geography. There is, can I put up um, sure. an image of the geography? Absolutely. Just to, just to start us off. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you all for coming. I, I, um, I know you're all feeling, um, yeah, festival fatigue has set in, so I'm, I'm very glad to see you all here. This is the topography of the, um, of the journey that I undertook um, for, for border. And it is a particular border, it's a very specific border, um, shared by three countries. To the east is the Black Sea, and this is where the border begins, um, at a river estuary uh, between Bulgaria and Turkey. And I traveled along this border and um, crossed it at various checkpoints with the idea of really discovering its true stories as opposed to the official history. I have to say that I set off, as is often the case with, with journeys, with literary journeys, you set off with something in mind, but it ends up being slightly different. So when I set out on this journey, I was really particularly interested in the Cold War, the legacy of the Cold War, because I am a child of the Cold War. Um, I am the last generation of communist kids, I suppose, in Eastern Europe. Uh, I was 16 when the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, some of you will rem uh, here are old enough to remember 1989, I think. Um, and I have always been fascinated by borders because growing up behind the Iron Curtain made me acutely aware of what a hard border means. Um, so I was always going to explore that, that border, the border of my childhood that I could never cross. So this is really what, what you're seeing there, that barbed line, I hope, I hope you, can, you can all see it, is really what used to be the easternmost stretch of the Iron Curtain. It's now a soft border, but only for some, because this is exactly the land route into Europe for refugees from the Middle East. This is the land route. Everything else you have to cross by water. This is the land route. And it was also coming through Turkey and into either Greece to the west or Bulgaria to the north, um, which is where the European Union begins bureaucratically. Uh, this is where Europe officially begins. <laughs> of course, as I discovered on this journey, you know, boundaries are much blurrier than that. Um, but that is, that is the, the scope of the journey. I think by Indian standards, by Asian standards, this is, this is a fairly modest <laughs> A s sort of um, a fairly modest journey, but it, it felt very epic because the landscape is uh, is mountainous. It's one of the last wildernesses of Europe, uh, one of the last habitats for the brown bear and so forth. So, so it's a fairly fairly challenging terrain. Um, if, if, if I might just just uh, uh, you know uh, um, sort of pose a few questions. Um, you, you, Kapka, you, you, I mean, you've concentrated on this very, very small sort of geographical zone, and this is one of the things that's wonderful about this book. It doesn't cover immense territory, and you and your life have, however. I mean, you left Bulgaria, you've moved briefly to Britain, I think, and then all the way to New Zealand, and then all the way back to, and now living in Scotland. Uh, but you've also, I mean, as a, as a writer, you've done poetry, you've done essays, you've done all kinds of things. So you, you know, for someone who's traveled physically and mentally so widely. I thought it was, it was it, it, it's interesting that you decided to focus so closely on really a rather small territory. And I mean, w w which, is, which is what brings out a lot of the richness of the book. Um, but why is it that you focused on this, this very particular uh, patch of territory? Because it, you're really, it's really, uh, the whole book takes place within just a few miles of this border, which is only a couple of hundred miles long, really. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, I spent time in various border villages and towns talking to people. I wanted to know what it was like to live in a border zone during the Cold War, but also now. I wanted to know what it was like to be a border guard, um, especially one of the old border guards from the, from, the, from, from the Cold War years who are under instruction to shoot, uh, under instructions to shoot, um, and they did kill many people. Uh, at the time, they were running the other way, from the Eastern Bloc into Greece and, and Turkey, from the Soviet Bloc into the so-called West, 
even though geographically speaking it's the south, as you can see. All these paradoxes. Why this border? Because it shaped my childhood. It made me who I am. Growing up behind the Iron Curtain was a formative experience for me and, and for, the <laughs> you know, for all of us in the Soviet bloc. I think the irony of the Iron Curtain, of course, was that it was designed, unlike borders today, which are designed to keep people from coming in, you know, the Iron Curtain was designed to keep us in. So, um, and it was interesting to see, I'll show you, interesting to see the original, yeah, the, there's some short stretches of the, of the Iron curtain, curtain still stand, and to see, this is um, an archival image from the 80s, well, this, uh, when the Iron Curtain was still up, and these are just border soldiers on patrol with their dog. It's interesting to see that this installation, it was officially called the installation, you know, an electrified barbed wire uh, wall was turned inwards towards the inmates of the Soviet bloc rather than outwards towards the imagined enemy. You, you um, described that in a tiny little passage. There are a lot of very beautiful short little passages. Uh, you're describing it as a child. How, uh, uh, you say, as it slowly dawned on you why the border was there so that people like us couldn't leave, you developed a permanent border-like feeling inside you, like indigestion. Which I understand very well. Do you, do you feel indigestion now? Do you still feel this border indigestion? <laughs> I think, I think um, people in the audience will be familiar with this border-like feeling because I think it's a, you know, India has, has some very sensitive and traumatic borders. And it's the same in the Balkans. I think it's, it's the same in all post-Soviet territories where the border was deadly where you could be shot for trying to cross it. Um, so that feeling, that's what I mean by formative experience. You know, you carry the border inside you. It's, it's, it's a wound, you know. It's not an exaggeration to say that. And visiting those places now, I'll show you what this stretch of the Iron Curtain looks like now. This is exactly the same place, but on the other side. Um, this is about one kilometer from the Black Sea. So it's a very sort of fertile area, and nature has taken over. Most of the Iron Curtain <laughs> has been sort of dismantled and taken, sold, sold for scrap. You know, literally the scrap heap of history. Uh, so this, this, this is one of the rare stretches that still stand. I think they should be turned into, into a monument, you know, um, a visitable kind of attraction. Right, one wishes, like, like the Berlin Wall is now. Yeah. Like the Berlin Wall is now, and this was an extension. Hmm essentially an extension of the Berlin Wall. And the deadly incidents that happened along the Berlin Wall happened all along the Iron Curtain, which in fact ran from Finland, you know, the border of Finland and Russia in the north, to this, to my border on, that ends on the Black Sea. Right. Um, and you, you describe later in the book how, how this, even when you're crossing the same border, with a, with a passport, there's the European Union, there's no trouble, you have absolutely no legal reason to be worried at all. This, the anxiety still returns ab about borders, just borders create this an anxiety. Um, there is something about crossing borders that is just designed. I think it's the... Do they do it on purpose when they set up border you know, checkpoints? It just induces a sense of anxiety even when you have nothing to declare, mm. even when you are not a refugee. Um, the Bulgarian-Turkish border, I'll show you the natural border on the sea with the Turkish flag on one side and the Bulgarian and EU flag on the other side. It's a very quiet, unassuming kind of place, but many people died um, during the Cold War trying to swim across, including lots of East Germans, Czechs, Hungarians who came to the seaside on holiday, to the Bulgarian seaside, and tried to paddle across into... Turkish territorial waters, now this traffic and this kind of, yeah, this deadly traffic, this, the, the tragedies of, of this sort of involuntary migration is reversed as people come from the east trying to cross, in, cross into the west. And there have actually been incidents of people being shot by border guards, Bulgarian and Greek border guards, um, in well, just in the last few years. So it's still a deadly border for some. Uh, and your, your own uh, departure, um, uh, as a child, I mean, here's another little passage which is just beautifully written. Um, where you talk about, say, you're comparing your, your flight to the flight of actual, refu you know, proper refugees. I, I, I don't know if you could describe yourself as a different kind of refugee. You might explain that a bit. I'll just read this little tiny passage uh, saying, we, we were lucky not to be running from the middle of a hot war, only from the end of a cold one. 
and not to be living in tents, but like Ahmed and Aisha, who had been spat out by the same loveless motherland. I love that, that image being spat out by a loveless motherland. I think you know, that's, that's exactly what the refugee experience is. It's shared no matter what the cause. Um, but what was the reason that you left Bulgaria? I mean, what was the, when, when you left originally, uh, 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 back well, in the 80s? Well, we were simply in the first wave of post-Soviet um, emigrants, really, to leave the Soviet, the Soviet world as soon as the Iron Curtain came down. We were the first wave in the early 90s. Um, until then, we had been prisoners of this, um, of this border. And, um, yeah, we were among the millions who made a life elsewhere. And... Um, Subsequent waves, you know, have followed. Um, it's, it's a kind of ongoing process. Um, it's part of globalization, uh, I suppose. There's, and there's a, there's a, there are ironies that come out in the, in, the, in the story that often one comes across uh, uh, in, the, in the book. There are waves of people who left for one reason, coming back for another reason. Uh, one of the, the, the beginning of the book, you talk a lot about Germans trying to escape through this last bit of border in Eastern Europe trying to escape from East Germany to the West and getting killed and shot and arrested and beaten and so on and so forth. Um, but then at the time that you visit, there it's, it's the border is crowded with Syrians trying to get to Germany. I mean, it, you know, and it's not so many years later. And there, there, there are similar circ circularities. I mean, uh, on the other side of the border, you meet Greeks who have come from Anatolia and Turks who've gone from Greece to Anatolia, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, so, so that there's been churn all around this border in every direction. Uh, Absolutely. It's, um, it's a kind of nightmarish merry-go-round. Um, you know, I discovered that the border is not really a binary place. It's a, labi it's a labyrinth. Um, and you, you're referring to the descendants of refugees from Anatolia and Cappadocia in Turkey who were forced, because they were Christians, to move into then new, the new Republic of Greece, and the same happened to Muslims from Greece and Bulgaria who were forcibly uh, removed to Turkey. We're talking about 100 years ago, but 100 years ago is not that long ago in terms of generational memory and what people carry psychologically and emotionally. So it's still in living memory. Oh. Well, this is something that comes out very, very powerfully in your book, is how, how close a lot of these memories are uh, and how the, I mean, it, one of the things that's interesting about this particular region also is, is the fact that along the border it's become terrifically depopulated. I mean, it's largely depopulated vi villages. So it really is populated by ghosts. I mean, refugees, displaced people, ghosts. It's a spooky place. It's a very spooky place. It's, um, it's a haunted place. And I think that's, that's partly the result of militarization. This was always a very militarized zone. I mean, the presence of soldiers during the Cold War meant that the locals left um, if they could. Is it not being, it's not being obedient. <laughs> we need to bring in the border patrol. <laughs> this is, oh, ah. now it's not moving very quickly. This is a disused observation um, tower on, in a border village. You can see the lushness of the, you know, of the land, the, 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 this, this tremendous sort of, it's a beautiful landscape, but this particular village, which ends with this tower, has 10 people left, and it used to be a prosperous um, sort of agricultural area, and it was then doubly depopulated by the um, exodus post the end of the Cold War, the exodus of, 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 of people. But I'm drawn to go to ghost towns. I'm, dr I'm drawn to haunted places. Um, I think as a writer, I feel there's, you know, I like, I like to, f to discover stories previously untold. And, you know, the Cold War has been, has been narrated in many official histories, but the stories I heard from people like Zico, one particular character who is a, a people smuggler or used to be a people smuggler uh, from a border village, uh, the descendants of refugees from 100 years ago, um, you know, the woman who walked for a week to cross the border in the 1990s. You know, to me, this is the true history of, of, of this border and of any border. I mean, I'd, I'd love to visit the India-Pakistan border, for example. I, I can only imagine what kind of stories can be, can be found along, along that traumatic border. Um, 
Absolutely, and, uh, but I think one of, one of the wonderful things about this book is it doesn't really fit into a category. I mean, I don't know what they sell it in bookshops. Is it sold as a travel as travel writing? Is that what they, is that the category that is put into, or history? Where where does it fall? I mean, what what do, because it, it it isn't travel writing. This is much more about uh, texture, the texture of the human texture of a place. Um, and uh, uh, so, wh 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 how do you categorize it? I mean, where where would you would you put this? Uh, well, it has been described as. Um a book of human geography. Um, I had to look up what that what that means, but I, I think it's it's a fairly it's a fairly good description. It, it's about a place, but the story is narrated through the stories of living people, and of course the living people also carry the ghosts of the dead, who were there before. I mean, for me, you know, for me this was a, a journey of exorcism in a way. That's how <laughs> that's that's how I can best describe this book. It's a journey of exorcism personal but also collective. Uh, it might sound a bit grand, but <laughs> it did feel as if I was exercising collective ghosts. Um, and whenever you travel through sort of tra traumatized topographies like this, and I think border zones anywhere in the world are traumatized um, topographies in a way, or certainly very concentrated places um, full of ghosts. I, I had the very much the feeling that I, 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 exactly. I mean, I, this, what I'd scribbled down here is that, there, that, that you're, t you're talking about human landscape as much as physical landscape, but that there's also a very strong element of healing. I mean, that you're, you want to heal yourself, but you also want to heal this landscape, this wounded landscape, and all these terribly wounded souls, too. Um, and there's also a, I, I sort of got the feeling that you, you know, this is a very enchanted landscape. I mean, you talk about the myth uh, that, that you, that, that, uh, uh, um, these extraordinary places, springs everywhere that are uh, the saints, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I get the, got the feeling that you had took it upon yourself or wanted to try to re-enchant this this place, which um, politics has tried to kind of disenchant. Max, thank you for picking up on the on the on the healing theme. It, it did become a kind of healing, uh, yeah, a journey in search of healing. And look at it. I wanted to show you a couple more images. Would you put on the next one? Yes, thank you. You know, this is, this is the geography of the place. These are beautiful mountains, rivers, and springs. And because this is also an ancient landscape, which dates back to, this is where Europe, Europe really began civilizationally, you know, with ancient Greece and Thrace. Um, I want you to also tap into this feeling of timelessness and ancientness. And as you said, you know, every spring ha has a story attached to it. Some of these stories are fantastical, others are, you know, curative. There's a lot of folklore and myth, and I was interested in that because a lot of it is passed on orally. Um, in places where so much material destruction has occurred, as, as on this border, and I would say in the rest of the Balkans too, because here we're looking at the Southeast Balkans, this is true of the rest of the Balkans too, much material destruction has occurred as, em as empire fell and nationalism, the, you know, the rise of the nation state followed. Oral history is still very important, and certain folkloric and I would say quite ancient practices still go on that you can't really find in the rest of Europe. And I was very interested in capturing that. Fire walking, for instance. Um, I had never seen fire wa walking performed locally, not as a tourist thing, but locally. And this possibly goes back to Dionysian rituals in antiquity. Did, it is did, still you did, practiced. You, you didn't try it, though. I didn't try it. I was no. <laughs> But what, what I was sober enough not to <laughs> attempt it, but some, some people, some visitors, some tourists do try it, and there are ambulances waiting. Um, so d alcohol is not the, 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 that doesn't help? Alcohol doesn't help. W what you want is an altered state. What you want is a trance-like altered state. So there is a whole, you know, spirituality attached to these essentially pagan rites, which have later taken on the mantle of perhaps Christianity, because now the firewalkers of this Black Sea region dance with icons. They hold icons of particular saints, um, Saint Constantine and Elena, for example, or Saint Marina. Various saints from the, um, you know, from the repertoire of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. But I think that Christianity or any other monotheistic religion is a very thin veil, you know, behind which you can really see the, the, the paganism, the 
the ancientness of, of these. Well, this, and, I mean, this, this is one of the things that's interesting that comes out very much is the amount of sort of mixing there is. I mean, this is a region that is, I mean, you have languages, the Bulgarian, Greek, Turkish being the main ones, but there are others as well. And then main, main religions, Eastern Orthodox, but in different versions of Greek and Bulgarian, but also Muslims. And then you have stranded people from all these places. I mean, you know, politics has tried to divide them up but they seem to be stubbornly incapable of being divided. I mean, I mean, you, 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 you remark at one, in one uh, place, there's an Easter service, I think it's in Edirne, I think it's in Turkey, actually, an Easter service, uh, a, a, a Greek Orthodox Easter service, where half of the audience are Muslims who are there just out of, because they like it. I mean, it's fun, it's a nice show. Is that, I mean, yeah, I mean, this was a border town in Turkey, Edirne, which you might, I don't know, it's not as well known as it should be because it was one of the centers of Thracian civilization in antiquity. It's a very interesting place. So it's on the Turkish side um, of, that, of, of the border. Um, and yes, Easter service, which had Christians from different nationalities, but 50% of the, those present were, were Muslims. Though I have to add that some of them were, had been expelled from Bulgaria. They, had, they were Muslims. There were Muslim Turks forcibly expelled from Bulgaria at the end of the 80s, which was a kind of horrendous incident that was hardly reported outside Bulgaria and Turkey, the two nations it concerned, but was really the prelude to what happened only a few years later in Bosnia. So these, these so are people who ethnic are cleansing on a mass scale. 350,000 people were forcibly expelled from Bulgaria, even though they had... You know, there were descendants of people who had lived there for centuries, ethnic Turks. It was a hate campaign mounted by the communist government, which was in its kind of dying throes. And it was looking for ways to distract people from the fact that it had failed as a government. So it found a scapegoat, an easy scapegoat, uh, the Turkish minority. And, um, yeah. And in, in, that, in that particular campaign, it was the Turkish minority. Um, and th these are people who are ethnically, uh, ethnically Turkish, but were more or less culturally Bulgarian, who were then chucked Absolutely. into Turkey and didn't feel at home at all. Yeah. Yes, some of them couldn't speak Turkish. Right. So they were caught between two worlds, and that's very much a border story I wanted to capture. It's an untold story. It's one of the many, many stories that happened on a mass, you know, this is a mass scale event. This is a kind of catastrophic event that was not reported and has not been properly captured in film or literature. So I wanted to capture some of that. And there's a, I mean, you, you, one of the great things about this book is that it captures to a great extent, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't, it's not fair to say this, but it's kind of history from the point of view of the losers, so to speak. I mean, a, a lot of the, 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 the groups that, are, that populate this border are losers I mean, in one way or another. They're people who have been refugees from one side or another. And there, there are some that are really forgotten. I mean, like the, like the Turks expelled from Bulgaria, but also the, the Pomaks is another uh, group or Kurds, um, you, 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 oh, you... the Roma, the gypsies. The Roma, the, gyps the gypsies are the most obvious, and I mean, who are believed to have actually Indian roots, I think, and mm -hmm. their displacement goes back forever. But in fact, you have, a, the, 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 you have a wonderful gypsy character who ironically is um, one of the only people who's permanent. I mean, he's in, located in one place. Would you like to talk about him? Yeah, he's one of, the, one of the most sort of memorable people I met on this border. He actually lives on the Black Sea coast in Turkey, uh, near the border. And he's, um, he's an interesting man. He's from the gypsy community of this small seaside town. He's a Muslim. And for the last 30 years, he has been a voluntary guardian of this rock monastery, a Byzantine rock monastery that the authorities, for some reason, have no interest in preserving as a... As as a cultural monument. So he self-appointed as a guardian of this rock monastery, even though he's a Muslim, and has sat on a chair outside the rock monastery for the last 30 years, unpaid. And when I talk to him, he is one of the chapters of the book. His story is, is, forms a whole chapter, um, because I found him so inspiring. He was one of the many inspiring losers, as you put it. Interesting word. I suppose, what, what is a loser of history? Someone who has known suffering. Well, I think, I think yeah, Donald Trump has redefined what a loser is. He's always talking about losers. Um, and basically, but a loser is someone who doesn't agree with him. Um. I think if you spend time near a border, you discover that. And if you look at things through deep time, rather than in the pre only in the present moment, you discover that 
if you wait long enough, you, you know, sooner or later, you too will be a loser of history because history is constantly shifting. And I think in a border zone, that is particularly tangible. So it's really just a question of time. Um, I, I like this. There's a little passage. Again, I'm just going to read one sentence uh, about a, a Kurdish woman who's sort of waiting, waiting to get from one place to another um, and sort of stuck there with her family. Uh, she carried her uncovered head high, her gaze hard and unflinching, her skin a bit pale after the long Balkan winter of waiting and smoking, cooking and hoping. So that's a wonderful, wonderful, quick, short sketch of someone who's really just... Yes, this was a Kurdish, Iraqi Kurdish family I, I spent a bit of time with on the Bulgarian side of this, this border, and they were waiting, you know, for, to have a si their asylum status confirmed, and the answer had been no, they just received the answer, so, so they, were, they were distressed when I met them. They'd been waiting for a, for a year, and the answer was no. So la when I last spoke to them, they had been waiting for two years on that border, um, not really being able to have any sort of normal lives, uh, and not wanting to go back, and I don't know what has happened to them. And I wanted to write, it, it is so difficult to write about mass movements of people, so the best, really, you can do as a narrative writer is to capture at least one story, you know, to, to get close to one person, to have one meaningful encounter. Um, and this family, <laughs> the irony of this border was that among all the people I met who were fairly hospitable, this family of refugees were the most hospitable. After inviting me to lunch, after spending a day with them, these people had lost everything, you know. They had lost everything. All they had was their lives. And at the end of the day, they said, why don't you just come and stay with us while you're here? Don't pay for a hotel. Just come and stay with us. We have a spare bed. And I think they said stay with us permanently. I mean, just, just stay forever. I mean, it wasn't, there was no open-ended. He said, no you are welcome ended. indefinitely. Right. Of course, playing on that terrible term that all people who have applied for visa know indefinite <laughs> leave to remain. And that's, that sort of hospitality seems to be something you find again and again. I mean, there's a, there's a priest, a dancing priest you find, Father Alexander, at one point, uh, and you apologize for having dropped in on his house. And, uh, and he, his answer is, we only like guests who drop in without notice, which I thought was charming. He's an interesting figure. He's an Orthodox priest living in a Turkish border town, and obviously, you know, he's one of the very few remaining Christians after the big exchange of populations a hundred years ago. Um, just like the Muslims in Bulgaria and Greece are, are now a relatively small minority. These, of course, were all Ottoman lands, um, you know, the ultimate sort of cosmopolitan culture um, for, for many centuries, reduced now to these sort of enclaves um, of, of people still holding on to the shreds of, of, of a once rich cosmopolitan um, world. So I was interested in capturing the shreds of that civilization before it's completely destroyed. Well, I think that's, that's one of the things that's interesting, and it, would be, it has a sort of uh, uh, resonance in India as well. Um, the, the zone that you're talking about was really, I mean, it, it, it's part, it was part of the Ottoman Empire for centuries and centuries and centuries. And it's kind of overall identity of the whole region was as a, a part of this vast empire where there were no borders. So people mixed freely back and forth. And so it became a complete sort of tabula salad all scrambled up of all kinds of people. And then with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, you have nationalisms coming in that put in borders that were never there in the first place. And you have, an, you have an, one of these wonderful brief little things you, you say, uh, uh, nationalism is like that. It won't let people be, you know, quite simple. Um, uh, but I mean, I think we've, we, you know, we've seen similar things with the collapse of the British Empire which then in, in the subcontinent threw up borders that were never there before. Um, are you against nationalism? Well, traveling along a border like this has taught me to have fewer opinions, um, but to listen better. So really the lessons of this border, the lessons of Balkan history in general, because this is very much part of the Balkan legacy of the Ottoman legacy, the Byzantine legacy, post-communism, all of those factors. Really, the lesson is that nationalism has been extremely destructive in the Balkans. Um, not that empire was perfect, of course. Uh, I, I'm not a, you know, 
I'm not nostalgic about empire. It, 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 it's... I guess I'm, I don't have the answer, but I want to ask the right questions. And uh, I think the people of the border have the answers. And by telling me their stories, by gifting me their stories, it was like receiving these wonderful gifts. Um, because these are really people who have witnessed something. Um, and, and you make it clear that in terms of nationalisms, there are no saints at all. I mean, the Turks may have been nasty, but everyone, everyone has had their turn at, 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 at being nasty. Um, I want to move on to something else. I mean, when we talked earlier about being spooked, there's a, there's a part of the book that, 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 that uh, was, is very evocative, where you, um, you encounter a people smuggler. Uh, is it Zico? Is that his name? Zico. Yeah, uh, is that a, do you have a picture of him? My goodness. Uh, Not of Zico. <laughs> Not of Zico. But, but who... Um, uh, you sort of, who knows the border really, really well. And you let him take you in hand. You're very brave throughout the book. You're, a lot of your encounters are, uh, you take some risks. But with, with Zico, you sort of trust this man, and you let him take you on a long journey, several days, and then at one point he takes you up and up and up and up and up and up and up into the mountains, right up to the border, to this very, very, you know, sort of uh, 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 dead end. And then you experience a sort of freak out. Can, can you talk about that? That was one of the, the, the sort of most dramatic moments, moments of the book. Yeah, I suppose that I, di I didn't want that to become a central sort of story because it's not about me. But it was a very, it was a key moment for me because it was a visceral experience of this border. It wasn't a case of simply visiting and listening. It was a case of feeling what this border felt like for the many who were killed there or who ran for their lives to cross this border. And it happened, this incident happened in, in these mountains between Greece and, and Bulgaria. This is one of the last houses on the border. And yeah, I was taken by Zico to this phantom village where there wasn't a single person living anymore. A very spooky phantom village on the Greek side, but it was essentially no man's land between the two countries. And the nearest um, town was 20 kilometers away and we were in his car. And I guess I had actually been in a state of heightened anxiety for days and weeks because, because I had spent all that time in the border zone. And he was a slightly dodgy character, but of course he was gold dust in terms of story. So I was almost prepared to pay any price. But uh, there was a moment when I thought so many people have lost their lives on this border during the Cold War, but also during the so-called exchange of populations after World War I and during World War II, there was the, the Greek Civil War going on and a whole other drama um, there. Who am I to think that I'm too special to die here? You know, this, this could happen to me too. So I thought that he was in, he, he had, that he had prearranged some kind of meeting with other people, smugglers, where they would kidnap me. And, you know, later I was told by a local woman, actually a mountain ranger, a Greek mountain ranger, who took me on a further adventure, she said you were crazy to you were crazy to go up to that phantom village with um, with a man you don't really know, and kidnappings do happen here, and all sorts of things happen here because nobody can find you in these mountains, you know, and you have no phone signal, so it's perfect, you know, it's perfect for smugglings of all sorts. Um, so your instinct was right. Yeah, I had the feeling reading the book that your instinct was right, <laughs> but it was pure instinct at that point. You just ran. In a, in a completely deserted yeah. village. When you're you in ran, a wilderness you, like you, this and you have no you phone signal. You run for 20 kilometers or so. Yeah. You just run, you know. You, you, you're not thinking, we do, you know, you're not thinking anymore. It's, you know, it, it's back to your animal instinct. And in a way, I'm grateful that I, I had that experience because otherwise I wouldn't have fully understood this border. Yeah. And I think there, 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 there was, um, you, you felt something else that was kind of hard to describe. Um, that you felt a sort of stickiness of the place, that it, it was hard to leave after a while. I mean, one of the springs, uh, there's a myth that if you drink from it three times, I think, you, you'll, 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 you're destined to, to stay. Um, but you, you ex describe the, the, the sort of um, pull of this landscape that you felt like somehow, in order to leave, you had to go through a ritual departure. What was that like? I mean, you, you described a very interesting ritual. Well, I'm drawn to water. I find something very... I think we all find something healing about water, and especially natural springs um, high up in the mountains. This, this, for instance, this is not a spring. This is a river. It's a border river between Bulgaria and Turkey. It's actually the natural boundary between the two countries, and it ends at the Black Sea. I, I visit... You, you mentioned... You said 
enchanted. You use the word enchanted. It is an enchanted and the cursed landscape um, in terms of the energy it carries and the symbolism it carries and, and the stories it carries. And I did find it hard to get away from it. It has an addictive quality. It's, it's as if you're descending into a realm, into an enchanted realm, which is also um, dangerous. And I ended up visiting this a particularly um, symbolic spring on the border, the, the, the spring of St. Marina, which is associated with the cult of St. Marina, who in turn is, a, is the, protectors, the protector saint of snakes. And of course, snakes are highly symbolic in, in Balkan mythology because they can turn into dragons, and dragons are of humans in disguise, and so on. So I ended up visiting that place and drinking from that, from that spring and finally just turning my back on the border and, and driving away after two years of traveling in, you know, two years of living with these ghosts and, and, and these stories. And it's always good to visit the spring, isn't it? <laughs> but there was another ritual. There was an interesting ritual. There was this, this overturning your footprint, which I thought was very interesting about kind of, you had to go through a ritual with a sort of uh, witch doctor. I mean, I don't know, how would you describe her? I mean, she's a sort of uh, a shaman who had to erase your footprints in yeah. order to lighten you and let you go, <laughs> yeah, which I thought was interesting. I'm not particularly superstitious, but I was very interested in these healers, these local healers of the border region. Again, practicing what is probably quite, um, quite ancient, ancient rites and beliefs, um, far removed from any kind of um, monotheistic religion, even though she said she was a Christian. But she still practices things like, li you know, lifting the evil eye, um, you know, lifting a spell, uh, cleansing your energy. And she performed, she performed for me a, a ritual, which I'd never heard of before, called um, reversing the footprint, where you step... Uh, you step in what she described as uncontaminated soil, energetically pure soil, and then she cuts out your footprint with a knife and buries it so that all that you're carrying stays in the ground and you can then continue on your way um, lighter without carrying all, these, all this burden. So she said that I was energetically burdened. I wanted, to, I wanted to know all about the border and that included phenomena that I don't necessarily engage with personally. But I think the task of a writer is to see and hear everything. And I tried to do that. Um, and also, she was an interesting character. Uh, she sounds extraordinary. Well, speaking of seeing and hearing everything, I think we're ready to take some questions. Uh, if we have, ah, uh, there's a gentleman back there. Do we have a, a, a mic? Can we, yes. Uh, back there, yes, that fellow with the beard and glasses. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, f thanks for that sort of lovely discussion. but. Um, and forgive me if my question is a little scattered, but what, 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 what I wanted to ask was, in some sense, uh, of course, these areas were tremendously cosmopolitan under these uh, uh, vast empires. And, and I, maybe I'm thinking more of Austria-Hungary, which is, I mean, that area I know a little better than uh, 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 the one that you went to. But um, if you, in, in some sense, when you walk along the modern borders, you recognize that the cosmopolitan, uh, uh, cosmopolitanism existed and it's gone away. You know where the other ethnicities are, because sometimes they live within you. Uh, but if you go to the old cities, um, which were actually the other location where people mingled, um, they seem to have vanished completely. And I was just wondering if you had a thought about, um, is it in some sense that borders are still more optimistic places than these old, once multicultural and now monocultural cities, which are actually quite depressing when you think about their past? Thank you for that. It's, um, well, it's spot on. I mean, it's, you've, <laughs> what can I say? The cities are even more depressing, indeed. Cities like Edirne, um, you know, which had multiple nationalities, tongues and religions practiced, including Jews, and I think there is one in Edirne, this is where one, the Orthodox One family priest, left. Yeah. One Jewish family left. It, you know, it used to be 40% Jewish. Um, and other such places. <sighs> You know, what's interesting about the border is that, of course, it suffers from the same syndrome. But it's as if 
it has more surprises. It's a periphery. You know, border, border zones are always both paradoxically at the forefront of history in the sense that the people of the border are the first to feel the effects, you know, of new laws, um, new policies decided on in the centers of power, which are usually far away from the borders, um, which is not a coincidence. At least in the Balkans, that's the case. And at the same time, they are forgotten. You know, they are the ultimate periphery. But the longer you spend, I think the longer you spend in the periphery, if you become involved with its local kind of, with, you know, with local life, with, with the kind of rhythm of, of things, you discover that it's, a, it, it's its own center, which, you know, calls into question the whole idea of centrality. Um, and certainly the centers of power, you know, have always felt, uh, I, I think, free to take, you know, to make decisions with impunity, which affect people in, you know, um, you know, in fatal ways, and yet the very fact of being forgotten, um, I think, inf gives people a kind of, I don't know, they make their own laws, you know, they, they survive as best they can, and I think that in itself is worth celebrating, and I think even though my book tells many sad stories, it ended up, I ended up feeling as if I was celebrating something. I was celebrating survival and commonality and the fact that we really do share much more than, than that which divides us. Um. <laughs> that's, that's the healing side of the book, I think, it comes out very strongly, in, but also very subtly in, in this lovely book. Uh, do we have m any other? Sure, sir, in the front. So my question is that, uh, have you ever tried to be a part of any of the two borders at the same time? Means one leg in the another border and one in the another. <laughs> did you, did you, did you understand? Yeah. Have you ever straddled the border with one le one foot on one side and one on the other? But that's that's your permanent state of existence, I think, isn't it? <laughs> a little bit. No, at that time, it's like you are in Pakistan and India both, and you are not a part of both of the countries. Yeah, no man's land. Yeah, that's no man's land. That river. So if you swim in that river, you are officially nowhere. Yes, so I swam in that river. It's a very nice feeling to be officially nowhere. <laughs> it, it means the pressure of defining yourself one way or another is lifted, and it's very liberating. And yeah, it's paradoxically the the border is is borderless. You know, it's a no man's land. Yeah. But at the same time, to cast a little shadow over this, I mean, at one point in the book, there's you describe a, a shepherd on the Turkish side of the border who just says hello to a, shep a shepherd on the other side of the border, and he's arrested and given a 14-year sentence for uh, treason. treason, which is shocking. That's the kind yes. of thing that goes this on. This is the kind of thing that goes on in border zones. He was, this is was in, in the 70s, not now, but in the 70s, during the at the height of the Cold War, when Turkey, Bulgaria had a communist dictatorship, Turkey had a military dictatorship. So the Turkish side was just as heavily militarized and patrolled as the Bulgarian side. And this guy, I mean, a friend of mine who is from a Turkish border village told me that, you know, this guy from his village, a shepherd, just waved across the river. He couldn't resist it. He saw a shepherd on the other side and waved and said, Merhaba, hello. You know, he shouted across. And his own side's soldiers, Turkish soldier patrol, saw him and arrested him and took him away in a truck. And, you know, and he did 14 years for treason. And later that man, who was a shepherd, um, hanged himself when he was... Um, during an amnesty, he was freed. So he, he actually did slightly less than 14 years, but he was, the experience was so de had so destroyed him that he killed himself later. And these are the untold stories of the border that I, I, I think are really important. Um, you know, the, these are the unsung heroes of, of history, men like that shepherd. Um, I, m I met quite a few shepherds <laughs> because they are some of the few remaining sort of residents of these border villages. Uh, still holding on to a, you know, to a, to an old way of of life, because they love the land, because they love, you know, their village, they love their homeland, even though it's a, it's a loveless, it's been a loveless motherland for them, but they love it and they're holding on to that which is still um, meaningful, and I, I found that very humbling. Um. Let's see here in the front. Hello. Um, 
Um, I'm in the phase of like Cold, Cold War 2.0 with the hegemons like Russia and China and climate change, the Black Sea and the Aryan Sea are shrinking. So do you see uh, how are the borders, can you reflect on the board scenario of borders now and the sovereignty and the culture of these countries as of now? I'm not sure I understood the question about climate change. Um, uh, due to the climate change and global warming, the Black Sea and Aryan Sea are shrinking. So the borders are porous and not, ch uh, and not changing. So like, if you can reflect on the current scenario. <laughs> I'm not an environmentalist, so, but it is true that the Black Sea is, um, is shrinking. But this, this, yeah, when we talk about history in deep time, this is, we're talking about this is maritime time as opposed to human time. Things are always shifting on a border. And even now, you know, the Greek-Turkish border, which was relaxed for a while, it's kind of hardening again because of the political situation in Turkey and uh, to an extent in Greece. But I, I think <laughs> the, the Black Sea isn't shrinking anywhere near fast enough um, to, to make that, that kind of difference. We're talking about millimeters a year, um, not big, 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 big spaces. We got another question? Actually, it has always been shrinking. That's, yeah, but it, yeah, most people are not aware of it because the, the, the effect takes hundreds of thousands of years. Would you, would you, uh, let's see, uh, sure, absolutely, yeah. Uh, hi. Um, talking about borders, we come to human psychology and the subliminal messages in every book that we read. We draw borders to kind of define our space, that this is my area, you know? This is the borderline. You can't overstep my borderline. So eventually, it's about the subliminal message of it being my possession, you know? And like you were saying, we share more than that which divides us. So I think being possessive somewhere is division too. To live a limitless life, to live a life without any restrictions or obligations, do you feel we really do need to define a borderline? Because, I mean, we live in a world today where we can't even define our identity. The moment we try to assert our individuality, we see a thousand trolls aping us and diluting our persona. So in a world like this, which is ever-changing, and it's like sand, the moment you think you've got it in your hand, it slips away, you know? So in a world like this, uh, just border, border. Bit of a division there. Your, your thoughts. Are you a psychologist? Uh, no, I'm a deep thinker and an author myself, actually, and a filmmaker, so, yeah. Well, this is so, I mean, what you say is, is, is exactly so. I guess, you know, when you travel in an actual border zone, you, the metaphor is always there, but the brutal reality is also there. And I think perhaps you and I, as, you know, more cosmopolitan people than the people of the border, have the freedom and the luxury to reflect on such things. If you actually live in a border zone, you know, you don't. You're just trying to survive. But certainly, it, it, you know, I'm interested in the difference between soft borders and hard borders. Um, I don't think it's possible to live in a completely borderless world, and that's not my message, and it's not my agenda. And the book has no agenda. It has no message. You know, it has a mission, but it has no agenda. So I'm not proposing that we remove all borders. Um, but I am proposing that we look carefully at what a hard border, both literal and metaphorical, does to us, you know, as individuals and as a society. And I think borders always start in the mind, you know, with very fixed, rigid ideas of what we are and what we are not. Um, and it is only later on that a physical border is built. So I think we have to be aware of the walls in our heads Yes. Thanks. We have another. Um, let's see. Do you, can you spot a? Yeah. Oh, all the way over there. Okay. Sorry. Oh, there's the, the lights are in our faces. It's hard to see. Uh, yeah. Hello, ma'am. Uh, what do you think about the borders that exist within a country? Because in a country like India, where so many cultures coexist, so. Uh, like crossing from Tamil Nadu to Kerala can be a really different experience. 
So what do you think are the dynamics of the borders that exist within a nation but divide certain cultures? I have never crossed that particular border, so I don't know what it's like. But perhaps a good example would be crossing from England to Scotland, which is a kind of invisible border. Um, it's not a bureaucratic border. So I suppose there's a difference between <laughs> the luxury of crossing a border that was once hard but is now more, you know, more of a sort of more of a symbol, and going through an actual checkpoint with armed soldiers. Um, I'm not sure that I, I, I have enough experience of India. Uh, I, I'm certainly aware that India's national borders have a lot of history and a lot of trauma um, attached to them. And I think there are many unexplored stories there, I, I suspect. Um, I think the, yeah, the borders are between different parts of India are more, uh, I mean, they're just polit they're, there's no physical barrier at all. So I don't think they don't, they don't quite uh, uh, cover the same. Uh, I mean, it, India is more like the Ottoman Empire or something like that, a great empire that's filled with different languages and people of different ethnicities that all move freely within the same space. Um, so you don't have refugees from Tamil Nadu in Kerala, I don't think, <laughs> for example. Maybe they should, there should be. Um, and another, uh, uh, something just on the theme of borders, um, the big burning global tiresome border question is, is Brexit. I mean, how do you feel about the re-erection of borders after they had been taken down? <laughs> so, well, I, 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 you know, it, it, it's a historic deja vu for me. It's, it's, uh, someone described Brexit as a self-inflicted wound. And in that sense, and yes, that's the beginning of a border. You know, it's a mental construct. And it infects entire communities, entire nations. And before you know it, you've got, you know, a hard border again between, you know, Ireland and Northern Ireland. So, obviously, that's going backwards. I, th I think there is a regressive, a regressive um, process going on. Um, and we are, the wit you know, we are witnessing this. Um, I feel like we are witnessing important events, um, how they will all pan out. Nobody knows. And in, in America, there's Mr. Trump trying to build a border fence, you know, I mean, we had thought that we'd moved beyond that in, in, in the last century. Suddenly we seem to be regressing. Uh, it's a bit tragic. Um, well, one thing I've learned is that from this journey is that all borders, you know, even the Iron Curtain are destined to fall eventually. It, it is their fate. <laughs> Sooner or later, if you wait long enough, you know, uh, like the Berlin Wall, you right. know, we felt like it would never come down, but it did. And that, that gives me hope. <laughs> But I think there's, a, there's also a passage in your book when someone says we'll, it, the border will fall but after we are gone, something like that. I mean, there's, again, <laughs> you know, the sad side of this. Yeah. Uh, any last questions? Well, I think we'll, we'll, we're going to... Ah, here's one last question. We were, I was just about to pull down a, the border and <laughs> stop this, but let's have one last question. Um, oh, sorry, you need to hold the, f the yeah. mic up. Like this? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful conversation. I come from Mexico, actually, so the Trump uh, message really gets me still. But my question is, uh, what message of hope can you give? Because we're in 2019, and it's the time where the most people are displaced in history. Uh, and a message of hope that you can give for the people that are actually forced to move and especially because you've met a lot of people who had to go through that and like, I don't know, like something inspiring that you can say because if they are forced to, I feel like they are the people who have the most history to share at one point. Absolutely. <laughs> There's always hope, I think. Um, but it, it seems to me, you know, that was a question, in fact, the question you just asked was, was asked in a session Yesterday morning, front line, the Frontline Club, by war, there were war correspondents talking about their experiences. And one of them had asked himself at some point, what is the meaning of witnessing so much human suffering but not being able to change the course of history? I think it's actually more important than ever to simply connect with others, you know, to, to be able to see and hear people who are not like you in some way, because I think we all have a tendency to, to live in our own bubbles. 
you know, culturally, experientially, um, generationally. So it's important to reach out, and I think that's one way we can contribute as ordinary citizens, um, you know, to a, to, a, to a more connected, a more humane world, simply reaching out and being able to see and hear people on a human level, beyond all else, you know, beyond all labels and, and definitions and borders. I think if you can do that, there is, there is hope. And I think that very much something that your book achieves, actually. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kapka. Can we please have a round of applause? And please do buy and read this wonderful, wonderful book. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. What an absolutely fascinating session to finish on. Thank you so, so much to our panelists, Kapka Kasabova and Max Rodenbeck. We are so grateful for your time. And uh, we'd just like to just do a quick personal thank you also to our wonderful team here at Samvad. If you could just put, do, put your hands together, not only for our wonderful panelists, but for Sujata, for Diksha, for Panini, for Ayush and Ashutosh, for Charlotte, the whole AV team, for all the camera crew. Everyone's worked so hard. Thank you so much. And for Laurel. Oh, <laughs> And don't forget, there's the closing debate, which is coming up at 5.15 on the front lawn. It's do liberals stifle...